So I'm Angie Santiago, uh, Angie Marie Santiago, so I can honor my grandmother um, with Wakefield Brunswick. Um, and I started a bright eyed and bushy tail, young, aspiring healthcare administrator in Orlando at Orlando Health. Um, and back then, uh, the executive programs would rotate the managers around so that we can get experience in different aspects of uh, healthcare administration. So I would rotate around the urgent care, OBGYN, medical records, just so we get an understanding of how to run all the things. So then we could then be promoted into a healthcare administrator and then run all the real things. Um, and there was one point where um, we started having issues like patients were showing up and in the middle of an asthma attack, um, or they were having um, an ill effect to their allergy. Apparently, I'm in peds at this point because that's, you know, um, we were having to put protocols together around, um, you know, our pediatric uh, patients um, as they were in the waiting room because we were trying to figure out between the wait times and emergencies, how do we want to bring, you know, move them around so we can get to the urgent kids. So I started working on a team uh, to develop those protocols. August of 1992, Hurricane Andrew came through South Florida, or was coming through South Florida, um, and we were getting ready in Orlando uh, for an influx of evacuees, um, patients, all kinds of uh, uh, things at that time. We had just opened up um, an integrated command center. It wasn't even command center. It was a 911, ask a nurse, and a scheduling call center together. So we, I was running that, um, and they asked me, this is as simple as it said it could be. It's like, hey, Ange, your dad's a truck driver, right? I said, yeah. Because do you think he can deliver some supplies to South Florida? This is our medical director at that point. I said, sure, I'll ask him. And it became 30 trucks, ABC, uh, Walt Disney World. Oh, you know, it's a full-on deployment. Um, my 30 dad, trucks, yes. 30 <laughs> trucks. That's insane. Right? And I'm like, pull my kid out of school. It should be a fun day. Um, throw my son in the grandpa's truck with him. And we head down, let this convoy, donated medical things, um, clothes, all kinds of stuff that was um, donated by the community. But we get there. They don't know who we are. They don't know why we're there. We have no place to drop this stuff off. We have no authority to be there. And I didn't know I was supposed to have authority to be there. And we still deal with this in every disaster, right? You, like, <laughs> no <it> cell phones, <laughs> no internet, yeah. right? Yeah. And we have to be in and out by curfew. Mm -hmm. It's completely silent down there. And the only thing I remembered is like, wait, my cousin's down here, you know, because they're army reserves and they were deployed along with National Guard. So I just pulled pulled the card and I asked for him. They showed us, you know, where to dump the stuff. And we came back and learned that we've got to do a better way of coordinating that because we ended up creating a lot of waste. Um, we didn't have FEMA yet. Uh, we had FEMA like from 79, but it wasn't, part of that, that healthcare response. So we started f finding a way to build a team to start responding to those kinds of incidents. And it changed my life. It was like, whole, I don't, I, I wanna do this. How do I learn more about doing this? Um, and, and being in that Orange County area, we just had an opportunity to start collaborating. Um, it was also a weird time <clears throat> because 
um, before we were integrating like national security into that kind of stuff, um, Disney was opening up a new pavilion called Epcot, mm -hmm. right? And they were opening up the China Pavilion. Protests were going on um, and, and they wanted us to do these mock disasters and mock you know, type of responses so that um, Disney security, emergency management, and the airport authority can work together on, on these, what we now call exercises, you know, fast forward years later, I start going to project management courses. I'm like, this is how we could have done this. You know, this is how we could have planned some of this a little bit better. Um, you know, the FEMA program was based in Florida. So we were able to use some of that collateral um, and become program managers, all volunteer, um, before we started working with the Atlanta region and becoming a thing. So I feel like Yoda, I like feel like I'm a hundred years old, but I'm not, cause it's not very old. But it, I think then like, so we talk about our career. I mean, we've yeah. known each other and worked together for long enough that we don't know how many years it is. Right. And that this part of our career, like I was still in Eastern Canada at that yeah. time oh, okay. and, um, and in the early nineties and, uh, and then went to New York city. And so I, Hurricane Andrew wasn't part of my uh, sort of inaugural <laughs> uh, disaster experiences. It was, um, it, it, it tended to be kind of more smaller regional things, but mm -hmm. definitely uh, very quickly. I mean, I think my very first day in EMS was, my very first 911 call was a small regional flooding disaster. Yeah. Uh, so I was, that, that was kind of how I entered it. Um, so it's extraordinary that, you know, I mean, everyone knows about Hurricane Andrew, but you're right, it was, it was, it was, it was a minute ago, right? And it yeah. feels like a long time ago. Um, and back then didn't have the industry or professional, uh, it, you know, sort of, I guess, just structure that, that mm -hmm. we have now, even though we know there's still more to do. But one of the things unrelated to that, as you're talking, one of the things I value most about you is that when you're working on something, when we're working on something, is your ability to see where things can be better, right? We're always kind of seeking that opportunity to improve process, quality, systems, all of that. How much of it was related to that specific experience and then being introduced to things like project management methodologies and going, oh, we have, we can do this better. Was that kind of the birth of that professional, like, aha, like, you know, where it's like, oh, there's, there's, there's always opportunities for, for doing this better. Yeah, I, you know, it, I didn't even know it was called, like, I think they call it systems design now. Um, and I didn't even know that till like, I was in grad school, like, was just a few years ago. Uh, we're like, oh, Angie, you're a systems thinker. I'm like, what, what, like, IT systems? I'm like, no, like, systems. Like, mm. you know, management is, even management and administration is a system of systems, right? So a process is a system. Uh, procedures or systems uh, in that world. Um, so I think I always saw things like even when we were trying, like when I was just a just a medical receptionist where you like had to wait for the next book for the doctor. It's like, I'm going to book you an appointment with this doctor, but Sally's using it right now. So I have to wait on the book you know, now you just kind of get on the laptop or computer or whatever, and you can book multiple appointments. Um, we had to design all that, you know, with these um, software engineers, like, because they didn't have the process down either. The, those first software engineers that we hired, they were like, well, we're from NASA, so we don't know healthcare. So, so you're gonna check in here and then we're gonna grab a medical chart. And then now we call that all process flow, workflows. Yeah, it's always been that. And then where does it go? And then how do, how do people get paid? And then 
Where does that bill go to? Yeah, that's normal. That's normal. Well, yeah, but I, I more and more <laughs> as you and I work together, I'm realizing yeah. our right. We're I, I don't know. I don't know how much of it. I, it's just a curiosity more than anything. But I feel like it's so valuable mm. in the work that we do beyond our roles in our you know business day to day, right? So workflows, process, systems are, I think, integral in mm-hmm. the way that we do business and, and just believe it to be core to the, the efficiencies. But I feel like also around patient flow and optimizing yeah. our response to disasters, like to me, it's like the secret sauce yeah. in a sense, right? From a very tactical standpoint. But this is the first time I've ever thought, I wonder like, you know, like where that comes from, right? What, yeah. uh, because it's not, uh, it's, it's not true for everyone that we work with hmm. to, to think in that way. So I like that term as being a systems thinker. Uh, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know that I know the, the source of it, but I've borrowed it. Fiz you, you know, introduce that term. It was and I'm my like, professor yes. that told me that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, now you see it, um, whether it's in climate, climatology or, or whatever, for, for me, it was always about what, what is the experience that the patient is feeling from the time they walk in the door to the time they get the bill, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. and understanding that system. Um, so I still feel, and even now, even though I'm not active in hospital administration and healthcare administration on a daily basis, I still see it all from a healthcare administration perspective, you know. So um, I never wanted to get away from that because my mom's like, why aren't you still working in a hospital? It's like, because I'm working for many hospitals. Right. You know, I can help more. Well, I think, and being a systems thinker, right, and having that healthcare administration background is allowing us to to design the, the way in which organizations continue their operations and respond to disasters in that more optimized way. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, ab- absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It is not a, uh, an approach or a technique or a conversation that I think happens in our profession very often. Right. We talk about the disasters. We talk about the command centers. We talk about, you know, mm. some of the, the actual technical areas or competencies as an emergency that's unique to being an emergency manager. Yeah, right. right. Or a business continuity planner or, you know, but we don't think about the supporting elements that threaded through our work, I think allows us to be more successful. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's funny because then I even see it like planning an event. You have an experience that you're hoping for your guests. So what is that? You know, what do you want to provide for that? That's a system. That's a system of... of to me it's a system (laughs) but you know concerts um festivals all of that have these processes or systems uh with an expectation of some kind of an experience so um that that and i'm i'm you know what i'm gonna give disney props on that one disney definitely taught us all what that experience is in orlando in the orange Mm -hmm. county experience you know threading that um, through the executive management um, school and, you know, is what's the positive outcome that you want from it. So actually, then building on that, so you talk about Disney, right? And that there's so, there was so much, there's so much focus on, on the customer experience. And we talk about in healthcare. Or they would call them the guest. The guest. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think, right, there's another thing around the points to how much language matters. Vocabulary yes. mm-hmm. agreement on that vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's a core principle in everything that I believe we do. And, and it's it just ensuring, right, there's agreement around the, the definition of, of the things, the words we use, language matters. So I think that's right around kind of the, the guest. And if we think um, of patients and pay, the patient experience, the patient journey, it was interesting as we thought about it more from a um, impact of a service interruption 
event or disaster to the to a patient experience, yeah. mm -hmm. right? We talk about it in terms of patient satisfaction mm. in some organizations. We may talk about, you know, uh, improvement to workflows or process improvement to improve the patient experience. But I think we have an opportunity to also think about it in everything from a service interruption to a disaster event and still honoring that commitment yeah. to the access to care, safe care, and what is that patient experience or patient journey. And we, you know, one, one time, like recently mapped that by creating a patient named Mary, who, you know, this is her diagnosis, this is what happened, and what her and journey her was through. moving yeah. through mm -hmm. the system during a service interruption event. And what it, do, what it does, or what it did, I think, is offered this human experience of, in that particular case, it was an, it was an, an IT service interruption mm -hmm. event. Uh, so it took something that was, felt very technical in nature and helped people understand what that actually meant for a terminally ill patient mm -hmm. that yeah. was moving through an emergent experience uh, at the hospital starting with the, the, you know, the emergency department and what that, what that looked like mm -hmm. going through that. And it was, it was, it was eye opening to some, it was eye opening to some. Yeah. So I think, I think we have a lot to learn if we ran our hospitals like Disney operates, how different would that be for a patient experience? Well, you know, ask Orlando health because they, it's still an integral part of how they move their patients through um, because um, Disney has influenced that whole region in how we do business and how you know we move in the service industry and, and industries, you know, whether it's medical or a restaurant or retail. Um, I'm going to even say in government, too. Even at one point, we had the same dress codes. And you know me in dress codes. Yes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's going a little far for me. I also, as a young, young person, was influenced by an employer making, using their influence. So like, hey, we want to use this information to improve our employees' health. How do we do that? Um, we had no barriers, right? So we, I don't want to get the HIPAA police on me, but we didn't have, that wasn't even a thing, right. right? So it was, we were now starting to collect data. They are the first employer that has same-sex benefits in the United States. They were covering AIDS. No one was covering AIDS. Um, and we had to find a way to provide health care um, no matter what was happening outside, evacuations, you know, if, as long as the mouse is open, we had to provide health care. Um, and, and oftentimes what I still find, and it really disappoints me, is acclimate, you know, in inclement weather, the, the, the practitioners close, urgent cares close. Um, and then everyone ends up having to go to the emergency room. It's like, I don't understand that. Why would you, you know, we want to be open because we want the emergency room to be open for emergencies. Mm -hmm. Now we've closed our general practitioners and our urgent cares because we have inclement weather or whatever the issue is. Um, and that wasn't the practice there. It's like we're going to work a little bit longer to keep our hospital from being overrun. That's, that's pretty, that, that was like, mind-blowing back then. I think that though, and that's unique to organizations that choose that approach. Yeah. We don't yet still think of the ecosystem of health delivery in a yeah. community yeah. as the health system. Right. We when you and health... I first met, we talked about that. Yeah. yeah. And it's still, right. It's still yeah. a challenge today. Like yeah. there's, right. There's a lot of, I mean, the, the healthcare coalitions are aiming to try and create a more united way of providing care and continuity yeah. of care in an event that affects more than one facility or more mm -hmm. than one health system. But we're still not really thinking of that cohesive view of all of the different provider types. Mm -hmm. It's not just hospitals. Right.
Right. So we can all deliver care of some kind, you know. So I think in, co you know, with COVID, we kind of saddled ourselves into like, oh, we're only going to provide immunizations here. You must go there. And rather than there were multiple options we could have delivered. And the areas where I found it to be most successful is the communities where they determined what worked. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it, there were some places where it made sense for the Department of Public Health to be the entity that was setting up and distributing and mm -hmm. administering vaccines. Whereas in other places, it was the hospitals or it was the clinics right. or some cross section of providers or, you know, the, integrating with the pharmacies. How did they, you know, include access to long term care residents? All, right. So the ones that I found looked at it from a more of a multi pronged approach and what works in this community mm -hmm. tended to have more success in both the operations of it and um, access. Yeah. Right. Because if it wasn't just just vaccines, right? We know that access to care during COVID uh, was a considerable challenge yeah. for um, a lot of our communities that experienced lack of access to health care prior to COVID. Right. That just right. became magnified. And so when you start to ask a community of people to go for services, including vaccination, where it's not somewhere they can either get to with ease or isn't an entity they trust, right. or cannot afford, right? You immediately place a barrier. We shut down the buses. That. We yeah. shut down, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we did a lot of things that were like, uh, how are they gonna get there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I found that the communities that started to think about how do we get the, yeah, the, in this case we're talking about vaccines, but how do we get the vaccines oh, could be to anything. the community where mm -hmm. they're at, right? right? Um, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not unlike even what you're talking about at the beginning of this. Cause like the, yeah. the, the donations management piece, that's still an issue in disasters <laughs> today. I know. So Our like I said, right? I, I have set up <laughs> yeah. more mm -hmm. just in time mm -hmm. donations management centers yep. in communities that had no mechanism or plan or resources to do that. Yeah. Still today, people will show up with donations with the intention to help, but no immediate request for those donations to be brought there. Mm -hmm. So you, whether you're asking for it or not, they're going to show up. So then it's like, okay, how do we, how do we, you know, in a just in time model, be prepared to receive the donations. But the, the truth is, is you have to design it, where, you know, for what the community needs and, and meet them where they're at. But they should it's, know what the community needs before. Right. So like, it always, it always intrigues me when the thing happens. It can be anything because, you know, we're, we're all hazards. But then we're um, projecting what we think the community needs, but not necessarily know because we're not of that community, right? right? So then we do dump, you know, a bunch of diapers on a nursing home area. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm being facetious there, but, you know, there's a lot of waste that goes with it rather than just do a quick, let's just pause a minute. Like there's like this push and pull where the public is viewing us like, well, why did they take so long? It's like, we need a minute, you know. To know what they need. Yeah, but no, we need to know what they need. We got to clear the road. We literally can't get there. Uh, and and so then, you know, my family and friends and all, you know, it's like, what's taking them so long? It's like, this isn't long. We're st the storm is still here <laughs> and there's, you know, they're still doing assessments. Just got, it's nighttime, like all different reasons why. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of not even understanding, right? The rescue phase, for right. example, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that is so critical. And then in many ways creates this perception of delays yeah. of other things. Mm -hmm. The, the, the donations piece, it was funny when you're saying like, you're being facetious, and yet my very first experience <laughs> with donations management is when snowsuits were being delivered to Honduras Thank um, you. after Hurricane Mitch. That, yes. So, <laughs> right? I mean, I was like, well, this is great. You know, people are cleaning and out their attics and sending their children snowsuits to Central America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether it's in a donations management scenario or anything else, how do we actually understand what the community needs? And therein lies, I think, the root of the issue, 
is we don't, we skip that step, mm. the, right? The, the community that we're aiming to serve, that we haven't, we don't allow for them to have a voice right. before we come in with a solution. With the trucks and the uniforms and the scary things. Mm -hmm. How do we help? Because awareness and education is not improving outcomes, mm -hmm. right? When we're, and in this case, right, we're thinking about our responsibility mm -hmm. with our friends and colleagues and partners that whose work we're aiming to amplify in health equity. Yeah. And saying how... But not amplify ourselves. Agreed. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, right? The goal is to be there in service. Mm -hmm. We're not yielding the results from the outcomes perspective yet. Now, my way of thinking, and I probably a systems thinking um, pr approach, but is the end in mind and working backwards. Mm -hmm. So if we don't even know what the outcome is that we're looking for. Right. Right. And by the way, that's not to be defined by us. Right. So who's asking the community, what does that outcome look like? Mm -hmm. What does that need to look like for them to say it's getting better, it works, it's... Because on the flip side, as great as systems are, there's also systems in place that need to be dismantled. Right? There's systems yeah. for good and systems perhaps for not, right? Or designed to work in a certain way. Yeah, that's why I struggle sometimes. Um, you know, it, it's the system, capital S, right, um, is not designed for um, the most of us, right? The vulnerable in the minority population, we don't feel like we should have to be resilient because, you know, in the indigenous scholars where they come from is like, the reason we have to be resilient is because the system is designed to make us fight it. So if the system, capital S, is designed to be more equitable, then the resiliency, I mean, the, should go away. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, we're requiring the vulnerable to be resilient rather than changing the system. Ruminating around in the social sciences and in the social workers world is, a, you know, they, they want us to fix this, but it's the system, it's not the people. Organizations are made of people. And so resilient organizations are made of resilient people. Arguably, what you're saying is saying perhaps yet what you're asking is the, the resiliency of those people may, in the eyes of some, rest with the most vulnerable. Or that because the system was designed by people, it can be changed by people, right? So if the system is unjust, but it's been designed by humans, then that means the human has the opportunity to change it. Was there a way for both the system and for the people to be resilient? Based on some indigenous scholar work is, is you work on the system to change uh, and then the people don't have to fight to become resilient. You know, so you know I love to study conflicts and systems that are conflicting with each other, yes. right? It's like, okay, so if an organization, we want organizations to be adaptable. We want, we want our, our work processes to be adaptable. Um, but our failures should not require that you, population, become more resilient because we mm -hmm. failed in our system. I think that's what we need to change. Fix the system and the inequities so that they're not the ones that are, are having to become resilient. What do we need to do to, to create more resilient systems or create incentives? Like what is it that's needed to build more resilient systems or to re-architect the systems we have yeah. now to be resilient? Yeah, so, you know, I'm always gonna try to find a root cause, you know, and identify what those um, what the cause of those barriers are. So um, there are some thoughts that until we, we really work on our racial injustices, 
Um, you know, every time I see the social determinants of health, I get a little sad because they're like all things we could be fixing outside of healthcare. Um, but also um, very basic of access to healthcare and, and improved access to healthcare. Um, and I think, I think it was yesterday we were debating, I can't even remember, you know, <laughs> a lot of discussions, but, you know, I think it's talking more or looking at ways to open up access and open up options rather than just um, still making it, making our healthcare system a market, you know, of competition amongst each other. Uh, I think that's what I saw differently in my earlier years was, you know, here we had a market. I mean, it's a definite market, but we were trying to find a way to make healthcare at that point more accessible to this group of people. Um, and I think that's still a model that could work. But we were all so trying to find our own way you know, during COVID at the beginning stages um, and competing rather than really just looking towards um, finding a solution that would remove those barriers, whether they're language, whether it's transportation, whether it's housing, you know, um, and work. I mean, I still find a lot of folks that we're doing better financially during lockdown because of some of the financial stipends that they received. You know, now they can't find work. So, um, you and I know, because a lot of the work that we've done together is working on these post-disaster injustices and post-disaster disparities. The violence goes up and crime goes up and domestic violence goes up, abuse goes up every single time. You know, but they're already there. Right. Right? Yeah, it didn't start at that point. It didn't it's start It becomes the exacerbation of all the things that pre-existed. Mm -hmm. The post-disaster challenges that mm -hmm. seem highly visible, at least to us, when we're there, and then looking at those root causes and trying to implement solutions there. And I think that tended to be more community-based and now we have probably an opportunity to think about more and more, especially mm. in light of the visibility on the issues we're seeing now with healthcare access and equity yep. and designing solutions together with our partners that ideally will work for the very people that they're intended to, to serve. Um, but there's more to do there, more to learn. I, I, I just, I feel like I have so much to learn there. Um, identifying what those conflicts are between whether it's a healthcare delivery or, um, you know, how did we do, uh, remember in the early days of the intubations, you know, and piggybacking patients and how did that, how did we really do there? You know, uh, who, who got them and what was their makeup and, and how was the outcome of that? Those are some of the things that we'll be studying for time and time so that we can improve our response. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think it's important now, and I, what I appreciate about this time is reflecting on on that, but not, you know, there, we lost a lot of lives and we're losing more still, but I think there's still that denial of, you know, we had some heroic efforts and we did and we do, but I still think there's a denial of we had some serious flaws that we need to address from an equity perspective and we just can't keep going like that. We're healthcare, right? right? <laughs> you know, early in our career, we talked about we're usually the larger, largest employer in the area. You know, so people true. come to us you know, to even charge their phones when there's a power outage in the area. So like people, you know, we, we had a rolling crazy power outage in Raleigh on Christmas Eve and people started showing up to the hospital to charge their phones. <laughs> and it's like, gotta feed them, gotta take care of them. You know, um, that's just a power outage.
Yeah, the hospital is viewed as that beacon. It is. To, That's why I remember. love it. That's yeah. why I'm still in it. I was going to ask you, I was like, so why, right? After yeah. all these years, why, what's, why, what's the... I'm just that lucky person that found the thing when they were young. Um, I do think healthcare, you know, healthcare is the one thing it's one of many things, but it's the one thing that we really could do better at in the United States that we could provide to everybody in a more equitable fashion. Um, but also healthcare response and planning, um, not just for the healthcare system, but for the whole community, right? So, um, because there's no healthcare community, no, no healthcare system without you and me as a patient. So, um, but I, I, I think we tried them all. We tried patient-centered this. We've tried all the things. Um, but I think going back to patient Mary and sticking to patient Mary um, is what we really, because we keep testing systems, right? Mm -hmm. I think I don't care about the system. I know, and I'm the systems thinker. Did it work for Mary? Did it work for Heather's grandma? Right, right, right. right. My yeah. mother. Yeah. And so it's got to pass the Maria test, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. If my mom doesn't understand it, Mm -hmm. It ain't gonna happen, mm -hmm. you know? So it doesn't matter if she can't read it, if I can't read it, because I can't see very well, you know? Um, if it's not available to the disabled or to someone in a wheelchair, some of cognitive abilities, we're healthcare, what's the point? And also to have them lead it, right? I shouldn't be leading that. I mean, all those conversations, but it's more around, okay, I need to connect you here and Let's get you some funding and let's get you in front of Congress and, you know, um, you know, because it, it, it's now getting to where the disability community is, is also the ones that are starting to lead their voice and, and demand equitable response and recovery still from COVID. Well, and it's a community that has continued to be disproportionately mm -hmm. impacted. Mm -hmm. um, so you already saw me get very emotional today yeah. about how yeah. angry still I am mm -hmm. about the losses that were experienced among our disabled communities uh, during Hurricane Katrina because mm -hmm. they couldn't get out. It's been a minute since then. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still very, very upset about that. And there's a really important bill, uh, you know, ready, R-E-A-D-D-I, that's out there um, that should be signed this this summer that's going to infuse more preparedness for um, you know inclusive communities I think we can champion stuff like that I think healthcare has to champion stuff like that those are decisions our medical people should have to make agreed yeah for the people who are watching and all the things that you've experienced the work we've done together your family what you've endured during COVID. What has your lifetime of experience so far taught that you, the one thing you want everyone to know? Hmm. That, you know, that community partnership and coordination works. Um, I stood horrified when I saw the Pulse nightclub shooting um, but also knowing who everybody was as I'm watching it on TV and how close um, they become, they became afterward, it changed Orlando. Um, and I still, you know, when I drive by my old neighborhood, I still see the Orlando Strong um, flags and I still see the murals. Um, I still see that there's a really positive way that we can work out of those tra 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 tragedies together. Um, but we do it in honor and in service to those who have given their lives unwillingly in some cases, but um, that we take that and, and plan better and exercise better and um, and remove those systems that are causing those barriers. I think that's critical. There's no more excuses at this point. I think other than uh, denial, you know, so I think we just keep yelling. 
gently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I think if we redesign some of the way that that our objectives are, um, I think, and focus more on the actual person, um, because I'm always bringing it back to my mom. You know, for me, it's like, do I feel safe to go respond? Do I feel like I'm going to be able to help somebody and know that my mom is okay? Um, and is this going to improve what we do? So I don't, I don't know. It's hard because, mm -hmm. you know, it's always moving. I think for everyone, they can relate to wanting to make sure that the people that we love mm -hmm. are going to be okay, mm -hmm. right? If there's... If there's a why that unites all of us, or that that mm -hmm. that's probably probably it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Get away more. Yeah, get away more from and and here get away more from the systems, more from the data. You know, those are the things that inform us, but focus more on the on the person, and not people, but one person at a time. Mm 